You are listening to the Whole Church Podcast. Our efforts to educate and unite the church are made possible thanks to our sponsors on Patreon. Please consider joining them for $3 a month at patreon.com forward slash the whole church podcast. The episode you're listening to is a bonus episode we did interviewing Dr. Thomas J. Ord about his newest book, The Death of Omnipotence and the Birth of Omnipotence. We hope you enjoy this bonus. Hey everybody, welcome to the Whole Church Podcast, possibly your favorite church unity podcast. You're thinking, wait, what? There wasn't a verse. This is the wrong day. That's because this is a bonus episode. I had the month booked basically and still desperately needed to talk to one of my favorite recent guests, uh, Thomas J. Ord the author of a ton of things, but today we're talking about his newest book, The Death of Omnipotence and the Birth of Omnipotence. Um, it's always fun when you have people you get along with and respect that you know are smarter than you, that you're still like, I don't know if I agree with you. It's so much fun to talk <laughs> talk to you. Um, thank you so much for coming back. Uh, good to have you. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Oh yeah, me too. And, and, because I did this really weird. We're recording on the wrong day. Not only are you receiving the episode on the wrong day, we also recorded on the different day than usual. So the greatest co-host of all time could not make it. But but in his lieu, in his lieu, he selected among all men the finest that he could find. And that was Christian Ashley, sent from Tiberius himself. How's it going, Christian? All right. I'm used to being second best. <laughs> you know, that, that, that's, my, that's my motto. Second is good enough. Um, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We love Christian. Christian is just as good as TJ in, in many ways. Um, maybe just not as a co-host. Maybe he was just meant to be a host. I don't know. Anyway, today we're discussing the book, like I already mentioned. So as things go on, the convention is about to happen. Please, if you get a chance, check out our website for the convention to see what we're doing. All the things we're going to be doing there are going to be a ton of fun. You no, know, it's just going to be a lot of fun. I mean, how many words can I put to say that? Like, I am so looking forward to this, to have a week off, to spend time with friends, some of whom I've never met before in person. It's going to be a blast. Head there to Chapel Hill with us. Absolutely. <laughs> Him and Will, first time I meet them in person. It's going to be just so great. As well, guys, we just started up, as you've heard probably before, that the we have started up the Anna Sal Ministries Podcasting Network. This has been something we've been working on for a little bit. Josh and I have been talking about it. There's a lot of good shows on there. We just added the newest show as of this recording. What was it? Two days ago? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And I have already listened through all of them because they're very short. Don't always agree with everything said there, but I really appreciate what is being said. So if you want something that's a little outside your comfort zone, I'd suggest, oh gosh, what is his name? Um, the Foul Mouthed Preacher. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And the, that podcast is the Bible After Hours. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. I help a lot with that show, and it's challenging because I'm like, hey, I uh, I don't agree with all this, but you know, I, I do I do a little bit of voice acting, I do a little bit of different things for them, and I'm like, you know what, we'll uh, I'll help you as much as I can. <laughs> that being said, I'm usually really specific when I share that one. I'm like, hey guys, if you want to hear something that I <laughs> that's really good, but maybe challenging to people who believe like me, you know, you try to find like respectful ways to like share. But yeah, part of the network because we fully support what he's doing and his heart behind everything. Um, he wants to stay anonymous, but you know who you are. I know you listen to this and I love you, bro. OK, so that being said, we're going to jump into my favorite form of church unity. It's a, it's a great, deep spiritual practice that everybody loves so much. It's not just for me, I promise. Um, it might be, but it is silliness because it's just impossible to stay divided when you're being as goofy as I am about to be. No matter how many times our silly question has sparked a debate and arguments, I will still say that it is unity engendering. <laughs> Today's question is, who is your favorite intentionally fictional God in comics, cartoons, etc.? I just put it that way because, you know, some people don't necessarily believe in God. I think our God's, you know, fictional. So I just added that intentional word in there. But, you know, if there's a God you like from like a cartoon, from a comic book, from a TV series, video game series, anything like that. Now, now's the time to bring it up. Ryan Doe's is listening right now, screaming Thor over <laughs> and over. But we can't hear you, Ryan. I'm sorry. I'm also catching up with that one right now. Across Ooh. to Bifrost. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. He's a great guy. So much fun. Um, we'll, we'll answer first. Give you time to think about it. Uh, do, you, do you prefer Dr. Ord? I forget. 
Tom is fine. Tom, Tom. okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I- I'm, I'm going to go first. This one's honestly really difficult because there are actually just a ton of great answers to this. Um, if we're specifically talking about, this is like a really like weird, no one's going to remember this. If we're talking about PlayStation All-Stars specifically, uh, then Zeus would be my favorite. I'm really good at it. That's just like PlayStation version of Smash Bros. Um, if we're talking like comics and stuff, oh, that is, it's, it, it's, it is a challenge. I'm thinking installing right now. I've got one. I can jump in. Okay. Okay. You go ahead. You go ahead. My mind My went to an old movie called Bruce Almighty. In Ooh, which Jim yeah. Carrey is yeah, engaging with one. Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman plays <laughs> the God character there. Yeah. And I think that's especially appropriate since we're going to talk about omnipotence. And that that movie title assumes God has a certain kind of power. Mm, that's true. That's true. Christian... Do you have anything while I'm, like, struggling here? Well, I have several answers because, uh, Dr. Ord, what I, excuse me, Tom, what I always do here is I cheat and have multiple answers for things. <laughs> okay, smart because, man. Yeah, that's what the people love about me, I'm sure. Yeah, I have four answers. I'm only going to focus on two. And, Josh, real quick, have you, how far are you into the Dresden Files series right now? I know you mentioned you were listening to the audiobooks. I'm like two books in. I'm okay, not, I won't say far. one of them then. No, no, Maybe go ahead. Three. Go ahead, I don't care. <laughs> okay, uh, Odin from the Dresden Files series, also yeah. because he's not only Odin, he's also Santa Claus, and which if you look at your mythology, sometimes that aligns. Very good. I also yeah. chose from Marvel Hercules because I love. I, I thought about yeah, that one. Yeah. Yeah, this this brash uh, braggart who just continually causes problems for himself, but also is continuing to try and help people and do good things. And then my third one was Talos from the Elder Scrolls who is a human who became a god. And I just find a lot of irony in the fact that I always play as a high elf dragonborn for Skyrim who hates the Thalmor and the Stormcloaks but worships Talos. It just brings a lot of joy to my heart that that's a thing. I like being the reptile species. Uh, The uh, Argonians? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, My actual answer. (sighs) My actual answer. (laughs) There are so many answers. (laughs) I know. That's how I cheat, Josh. That's what I do. You're killing me. I chose not... There's a character named Godzilla, but he himself is not a god. But there is a god appearing in the 70s films. And that is our gracious overlord, our beetle cockroach hybrid, Megalon, worshipped by the Seatopians, teaming up with Gigan, one of my favorite kaiju of all time. Megalon is my favorite god in all of fiction. Man, there. The thing is, like, I just love fictional religions a lot. And I know that's weird. I just really enjoy this topic. So it, it's, it's difficult. Uh, it feels like it's wrong not to mention one of the God of War gods. Um, because my favorite Disney movie is Hercules, it's really hard not to say that. Um, you know, I'm going through comics. There's all the new gods in DC and all that. There's Loki. Everybody loves Loki. I'm going to do a pick that literally no one else. Well, there's like three other people could pick. Back in high school and some of college we made up our own role-playing game. I consulted a few different professors. We built an entire system that involved what religions would eventually become one day. And then also what would human bodies eventually evolve into one day. And we played that. And one of the religions in this made up world had a God that was the white lion. I really liked him because his appearance made it seem like he was going to be pure and all powerful and all these things. And yet what he ended up being was this angry god that kind of feigned all power which is funny because of today's topic so yeah i was like yeah you know i'm gonna go with that and just have to explain people what i'm talking about (laughs) this may be our longest silly question segment i'm sorry guys (laughs) it's my fault (laughs) with that dr ord we are here tom um to discuss your book but first uh let's let's get into some of the basics i'm stealing christian's part so he's gonna steal my next one what (laughs) What's your most recent book about? We mentioned the death of omnipotence and the birth of omnipotence, which is one of those. Uh, man, that's a that's a big, triggering, eye catching title. Um, what inspired this one, and where can listeners go to learn more about it and pick up a copy? Well, some people give titles a book and they try to shock you. They don't really mean what the title says. My title says the death of omnipotence. I really mean it. I think omnipotence is dead, or at least it should be. We should stop calling God omnipotent. If by that we mean God is all-powerful, can do anything, or can control others in creation. And this book lays out in four chapters, kind of like four movements of a symphony, 
the reasons we should reject omnipotence, but then offers a constructive replacement. I've written books in the past suggesting that God can't control others. In fact, one has the provocative title, God Can't. And this book, I wanted to also propose an alternative, a way in which we can talk about God's power. So that's what this book is about. You can find it on all, you know, your usual online booksellers. Yeah, I um, this is just a quick side note. One one of the most aggravating things when a book is only deconstructive that just irks me. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite authors actually, Frank Viola. He writes uh, Pagan Christianity, fantastic yeah. book. Completely deconstructs a lot of the things we think should be in church, and it turns out they just absolutely shouldn't be. And he's like, oh, come back next time and I'll do the reconstruction book. And I was like, OK, I guess I can wait. It was really aggravating. And then the reconstruction book for me fell a little flat compared to the predecessor. I was like, I just I don't like what you replaced it with as much as your argument for deconstruction. But I also yep. don't want to be left there. Yep. So even though I love him as an author, respect the guy is also just kind of like, man, this is. um, hmm. But with you, with you, you have a. The omnipotence thing, it, it, it was a real challenge for me. I, I'm going to throw out a little cushion for people first. I, I still don't fully agree with where Tom's at, but um, whenever he kind of explains a lot of how people do this omnipotence, but God can't create something God can't lift or omnipotence, but God can't be anything but love. He was like, well, that's he can't do those things. I was like, OK, I see what he's saying. There is a lot of these people who say omnipotence that do God can do everything but. So that's kind of where I was like, okay, that's the yeah. spot of where I like to keep the conversation. I like that a lot. Yeah, that's actually all of chapter two. It's looking philosophically at people who have said God is omnipotent, but, and they give these exceptions, these provisos, these qualifications. In fact, that chapter is called Omnipotence Dies a Death of a Thousand Qualifications. And when I say people qualify omnipotent, I mean not just progressive people, but conservative people. Some of the most conservative theologians in Christian history have added all these yeah. things that God can't do, like make one plus one equal 367, or stop existing, or tell a lie, or, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's literally, if we went one by one, we could come up with millions, even billions, if we took the time, of things that God can't do. Some of those things, in fact, you and I can do. Like, for instance, tell a lie. You and I can tell a lie, but God can't. Um, so that's a big part of the my um, argument for why omnipotence is dead. Hmm. I have so much to say that, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait. I'm going to wait because I know Christian is begging to do his next part. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. We'll get there eventually. So, Tom, how, how would you say that the reception has been to this book so far? You know, it's been surprisingly positive. You know, the book's only been out in the world maybe three weeks, four maybe. I don't know. I've kind of lost track track of time here. Um, and, you know, the reviews are almost all positive in part because people who bought it are people who've read my past work. And so, you know, it's uh, even though there's new ideas here, it's not a shock to most of them. Um, mm -hmm. So once more people get a chance to read it, then I suspect I'll see more negative reviews. But I think what <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think Fair. what kind of surprises most people, especially people like me who come from an evangelical background, is my first chapter in which I address the biblical issues. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big shocker to people. Also, for those wondering, we have interviewed Tom before. I will have that link down below in the show notes if you kind of want to know just more about his history and some of the other background stuff that he mentions here. Yeah, and I'll say as far as other hosts are concerned for systematic ecology, I was just re-listening to the uh, My Hero Academia episode we did, and I'm fairly certain Nick mentioned that he had just received your book, one of our other co-hosts there. Mm -hmm. So you have one, yeah. at least one other fan here. Good, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. I'm a big fan. I have not got this book yet, just for <laughs> for clarity's sake, because I, I had really only started reading your work probably was it back January, or December, something like that. So it's like ah, there's a lot of books to catch up on. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Yeah. There's my book. My reading list is pretty high. Yeah, yeah, and I, I probably I probably won't read all of them. If I'm be honest, uh, particularly I'm actually I, I'm I'm right now I'm on the verge of deciding whether or not I want to read uh. It was another one you recently did. It was uh, with your daughter. The uh, oh, the why Nazarene the church, church should Nazarene. be yeah yeah why it should be fully LGBTQ plus affirming. Yeah, 
I, I, I'm on the border because I'm like, I'm really interested in the arguments, but also I'm not Nazarene. <laughs> you know, I'm like, yeah. you know, also <laughs> well, <laughs> the arguments will apply to most most denominations, most groups. You don't have to be Nazarene to appreciate it. Wow, it but must be so nice to have a, a book list that's not required by the classes you're in right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So usually the way that these shows work um, for the whole church podcast, if you haven't listened before, usually I have an outline. We ask a bunch of specific questions to get to know the guest a little bit better, to know their beliefs, to know what they're doing. And we kind of just play, get to know them. Hey, how do we have unity? Today, I wanted to do a little bit different and do a little bit more pushback, a little bit more conversational, because I know that Tom is able to do that. <laughs> I've heard yeah. him on other podcasts. I'm like, hey, let's have just a yeah. really kind of a more raw, real conversation about about the topic of this book, Omnipotence. Um, so earlier, you were talking about God can't. And, and I guess my first question um, to kind of kick this part of the conversation off, which I'm inviting Christian into. Christian, just whatever pops in your head, say it, no matter how awful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is it bad? Do you expect that out of me? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, no, no, no. What I was going to ask, though, is instead of getting rid of omnipotence, why wouldn't we work on defining it better, if that makes sense? Like, mm. why do we, why can't we say that it's not about power as much as, you know, God could physically just change math? But he won't just because he won't. Like, why do we have to get rid of omnipotence, I guess, is sort of the question. Yeah, there's quite a few reasons why we think – I think we ought to get, get rid of it. One of them we've already men mentioned, and that is just philosophically untenable in the sense of having to qualify what we mean every time we say the word if we want to be clear. And people have been doing that for centuries. But um, if you know, if, if I went around saying – you know, the All Church podcast was the greatest podcast uh, in the interwebs. Correct. But then I started pointing out all the flaws, all the things that I don't like. After a while, people would say, well, well, how is it the greatest <laughs> if it's got all these flaws, right? And so that's yeah. what's happened with this word omnipotent. We've said God can do anything, and then we've qualified it over and over. But I think the, the thing that first got me thinking about why we should scrap omnipotence uh, wasn't philosophical. It also wasn't biblical. It was experiential. It was <laughs> the questions of evil. Um, if we say God can do anything, but God is choosing not to prevent evil, I suspect that means we're not portraying God as a perfectly loving person. Suppose uh, my my grandson and my granddaughter are over at my house, and my granddaughter starts to choke my grandson. And it's actually going to choke the life out of him and kill him. And I've got the ability to intervene and rescue him. But suppose I say, I'm not going to cause this. I'm just going to allow this killing. I mean, I can do whatever I want here, but, and I'm not, you know, I'm not the one doing the killing, but I'm just going to allow it. Then you're not going to call me a loving grandfather. Mm -hmm. If we say God has the power to prevent evil, but chooses not to, I don't think we should call this God loving. So there's good reasons in terms of our experience of evil to reject the idea that God is omnipotent in the sense of three senses, in the sense of God can do anything. I don't think that's true. In the sense that God exerts all the power in the universe, I don't think that's true. And the big one, I don't think God can control others and creation. So God's not omnipotent in those three senses. I think for me, it's probably just more of a semantic thing that I get hung up on. I, like I don't – I think most of my agreement disagreement is there. So I'm going to try to put that aside because this isn't the, you okay. know, the whole <laughs> linguistic podcast. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to try to put that aside uh, and kind of focus more in, in what you're actually talking about. I do find some of your reasoning compelling when it comes to especially that first thing of a loving God situation and the problem of evil, thinking about that specifically. Yeah. Um, Especially because of how often I see that solved poorly, if that makes sense, sure. of how many churches and people I know who kind of do, well, you know, a loving God wouldn't let you get ran over by a car if you were to run in the street. That's the one I hear a lot. You know, a parent wouldn't let yeah. their kid just run the car. And that's why God punishes us. And I'm like, OK, uh, uh, I don't like yeah. that as much because then no. it also gets into like they'll take that and use it. Well, that's why you're poor off financially. That's why this happened right. to you. And I'm yeah, like, that's I'm um, not, a, I'm not the Bible that. doesn't support that at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's happening here? <laughs> yeah. No, so, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. So I, I do find. It compelling because it keeps us from that, at least. Okay. 
Um, I, I think I personally would probably take it more of a kind of to do the opposite. And I hate to do that to kind of reverse the burden of proof, so to speak. But I'm, I'm thinking yeah. more of like, I also just, which I think you also said this, I hate the idea of a controlling God. Right. So if I'm thinking, if I'm starting with, and I guess this is what you're challenging is the premise. But for me, the premise is, you know, God is all powerful. And then I'm like, well, I don't like this idea that God's just letting people kill each other. But I also don't like the idea of God taking away free will because we would also say that that's not loving. Right, right. And, yeah, and I I'm see looking. yours as like a, as the third way out. And for me, and I know you, <laughs> what's funny, you criticize this a lot. But for me, I'm like, I like there kind of being this mystery of the divine where I don't fully get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I also I criticize that. I, You're right. I, I, yeah. But I, me, I like. <sighs> let me take another okay, tack. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me start with the premise that you want to affirm that God is all powerful. I think that's the word you used, all powerful. And let's ask, why would you want to do that? Now, if you're like most Christians, you are probably say, well, because that's the way the Bible describes God. One of the things I do in this book is I show you, show, show readers that that's simply not the case. If we read the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, every time we see the word God Almighty, it's a mistranslation of one of two Hebrew words. One of those words is Shaddai, which means breasts or mountains. The other one is the word Sabaoth, which means armies, hosts, councils, groups. Mm -hmm. Those two words get translated as the word Pantocrator in the Greek Septuagint in the third and fourth centuries. Pantocrator means something like all holy. That word Pantocrator ends up in the New Testament only 10 times. And then it gets translated as omnipotent by Jerome in the I think sixth century or something. Anyhow, my point is this. Every time you see the word almighty in the Bible, you're not seeing in the, the original languages don't mean almighty. So if it's a biblical argument, I'm making I'm saying there's no place in scripture for it. Now some people will say to me, okay, maybe the word omnipotent or almighty or all powerful or whatever, maybe the word's not there, but the idea is there. Well, if the first notion of omnipotent means God exerts all the power, it seems very obvious to me that that's not the case in scripture. I mean, not only do creatures exert power, sometimes they exert power in ways that are sinful that God doesn't want. If you mean by that, that God can do anything, there are a couple of biblical passages that kind of sound like that. Uh, in the New Testament, a couple of times, maybe three times, we hear something like, with humans, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Mm -hmm. But I address that in the book by noting that there are dozens of instances in scriptures in which the writers say God can't do things. God can't be tempted. God can't grow tired. God can't um, um, deny himself. God can't, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And so... Um, I don't think the biblical witness gives us a good reason to think God is all powerful in that sense. And then the third one, which I think is the, the one that is probably the most interesting to people is, does the Bible explicitly say or imply God controlled creatures or creation? I think lots of Christians, even scholars, have come to the text assuming God has that ability and then read it into the stories, but nowhere in the entire Bible. Does it explicitly say God alone brought about these results? So if your premise is that I have to believe God is omnipotent, almighty, all powerful, because that's what the Bible requires, I'm arguing in the first chapter of this book that the Bible does not require that. What do you think of that? I Yes, and <laughs> I, 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 I hate being that guy. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I think – all of that's true from, from what I tell. I, I don't think it says almighty or says any of that. Um, I'm iffy about the control thing just because I, you know, I haven't looked through the Bible just for that thing. And sure. it, it always feels weird to be like, that's definitely not in this 2000 page book. Cause I'm like, man, yeah, it's so easy to think I could have missed something. <laughs> Sometimes I'm at conferences and I'll offer a thousand dollars to anybody in the audience. who can find me an example and they'll come up to me with like Pharaoh hardening or God hardening Pharaoh's heart. And I'll say, no, that doesn't explicitly say God controlled. In fact, several times Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And who's to say that hardening means control? We just made that leap. God confirmed say, Pharaoh's heart. Yeah. 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 Or they'll yeah. say, well, what about the creation of the universe? And I'll say right there at the beginning, there's something that the spirit hovers over. 
or they'll say the resurrection of Jesus. And I'll say, no, there's nothing explicitly says God alone brought that about. Uh, so yeah, you, you, you may have, I'm putting you on the spot when I say mm. what I'm saying, Oh yeah, but I've put lots <laughs> of people on the spot and so far no one has come up with anything. Yeah. I, I'm actually, I'm going to give Christian a chance. Did you have anything biblically that you wanted to bring up before I, <laughs> about this in particular? Else? No, I was not prepared for that. So that's on me. I mean, in general, <laughs> well, I'm trying to over- throw out, can I throw out one of the common uh, examples in Go for mean, it. a lot yeah. of people think that in order to account for miracles in the Bible, you have to have a controlling God. And one of the arguments I make in this book is that that's not the case that the miracles can happen because creation cooperated with God, or in the case of inanimate matter like water, um, the conditions of creation can be conducive for the miracle to occur. And the upside of this argument, well, one of the upsides, is that then it also helps us to uh, solve this question of why doesn't God do more miracles? Like, you know, why is it that when we go to church and pray for somebody's cancer, oftentimes they're not healed? Uh, if God can up and single-handedly do something and God's perfectly loving, then why doesn't God heal people? And, of course, you all know the, an- the usual answer is it's a mystery. God's trying to teach them a lesson, all that kind of stuff that I, I don't find satisfying at all. So this way of thinking about miracles as involving some kind of creaturely cooperation at some level of complexity or the inanimate uh, conditions of creation being conducive – actually can account for miracles and account for why there aren't miracles when we want them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm going to try and put all these thoughts I'm having into words. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I've been all over the place during this conversation, but I want to say this, but you said something else. And then Josh said something. It's like, man, maybe I'll get back to those thoughts. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. It's like, I, I want to start under the premise is that we are working under a human word that is heavily flawed by the fact that we are human when it comes to, the almighty to when it comes to omnipotence. So I don't, the whole linguistic God never, podcast. <laughs> yeah. I, God has never used the word omnipotent as far as I'm aware. I'm pretty sure there's not in scripture to describe himself. So we have attributed that to him. Now for me, I don't think it's, it's that list of, well, how do you go from this all powerful to having no power like us, comparatively speaking to where God obviously has way more than us. It, I don't know if there's exactly a word for that. So that's the best we've got. But I think I would still use it to describe God in the fact that he is working within the rules that he created and that there's no other being out there that can make rules where there are limitations to those rules. Uh, You know, you know, can God create a a rock heavier than himself than he can't lift? Can God, you know, make a burrito so hot that he himself couldn't eat it? You know, all these (laughs) joke answers you get sent out. It's like, yeah, well, those that confirms that God is working within the rules that he created. So that shows me his power, his omnipotence in that way. And once again, omnipotence, we, we've all figured out is probably a very terrible word to use because it doesn't mean what we think it means. So I love it. That's a good Princess Bride line right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm just waiting on Tom to tell you he has come up with a new word. <laughs> and actually, I do yeah. like uh, uh, omnipotence. The, omnipotence the idea is how I say it, but yeah. 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 Cause isn't it AMI potent? Yeah. Okay, That's right. challenge round. Say it differently each time. Yeah, say it again. <laughs> How you say it, Tom? I say it omnipotence. Omnipotence. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Uh, and I like the idea behind that is that, you know, of God being loving towards us, you know, coming from uh, those words used there. But at the end of the day, I disagree with the idea of God not being able to, or excuse me, not being loving and that he allows bad things to happen. In the fact that we live in a sin-filled world, and what is that verse from Peter? Uh, first or second? I I can never Just remember summarize. verses. Yeah, of okay, you know, me, he, he allows those things to, to happen. Yeah, uh, he allows these things to happen for people to come to repentance. So go ahead. All right. So first, I want to begin with what I agree with. I agree that there's never going to be the perfect word, and omnipotence. My alternative, omnipotence, is not perfect either. Words are never going to be perfect. So I'm with you there. Now let me tell you how I disagree with you. Go for it. Um, <laughs> most Christian theologians, including most conservative Christian theologians and philosophers, would say that there are rules, to use your language, that God didn't make up, that God is subject to. We would say those rules come from God's nature, and God didn't create God's own nature. 
in the philosophical language, it's all about platonic forms and all this sort of stuff. But anyway, I won't go nerdy in that direction. I'll just say, um, you know, maybe some people will say God made up the laws of nature, but there are other laws like the laws of logic or the laws of mathematics or the laws of God's own nature that most, even the most conservative philosophical theologians would say God didn't make those up. They're somehow in God everlastingly. But my more important point is the second one. Your approach has the liability, I think, of you having to look a rape victim in the eye and say, God could have stopped what happened to you, but chose to allow it. Yes. I get the opportunity to look that same person in the eye and say, nope, God didn't cause it. God didn't permit it. God didn't allow it. God was with you trying to work with you and you're your, the perpetrator to stop it. But God didn't allow something. And I tell you, I personally think that's a huge advantage to my view. That's perfectly fair. I'm not attacking. I'm just saying that's how I think yeah. think of these yeah. things. Like yeah, That's yeah. a big advantage. No, okay. I get that completely. I mean, I don't like the fact, I don't think anyone here would say, that there's still child slavery and sexual slavery rampant yeah. throughout the world. That you know there are rape victims out there in the world. That there are you know these flatworms that can just enter a person's body and cause irreparable damage to them. Like I have to yeah. wrestle with that every single day. Like God allows that to happen, in my point of view. Like why is that? How could a loving God do that? And at the end of the day, it's like I have a very limited perspective. Is where I'm yeah. coming from. So why does God allow it? My answer is I don't know. I think we would all say I don't know, but. There is something that's yeah, going to be wanna, done that is going to bring glory to him. Yeah. I don't want to come across as like having all the answers. So oh, yeah, let me yeah. also say that, oh, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. I've, I'm proposing a model of thinking about God that I'm not certain is right. So yes, I don't yeah. know it. But I yeah. am saying this model has some advantages, I think, that your model doesn't. Now, mm-hmm. what most people say in response to me is they'll say, oh, so your God's not in control must be a wimp must be up on Mars eating popcorn, watching us all (laughs) suffer. You know, your God's an impotent God. And that's why in the last chapter, I coined this word amipotent to try to talk about God being the most powerful being in the entire universe and yet being uncontrolling. So I I got like... I've been I've been backloading a bunch of thoughts, so Good. I'm just gonna I'm gonna release a bunch <laughs> of we all have Christian and I'm gonna throw it to you at the end. <laughs> <laughs> So, first, first, in response to some of the things said so far, before I throw out my whole new thing, I want to say, uh, I I personally really feel like all Christians. So I'm not talking about either of you specifically. I think we all do this thing where we over like over personify God as if. Oh, he's just like a parent preventing a children from child from danger. I'm like, well, he's not though, because he's not human. He's spirit, and I don't think we fully grasp what that means. And I don't say I have a good answer to that. I just, I do think that's one issue. I think there is another issue of time. Assuming that God relates to time the same way as us, as if He could stop it in that moment instead of being outside of time. And who we we don't have the ability to comprehend what it's like to be outside of time. Which I'm not saying God is outside of time. What I'm saying is. I don't think we fully grasp how God relates to time, especially with all the scientific advances where we know that time really kind of depends on mass and gravity and all these other things. And is God affected by these things? I don't know. I don't know what it spirit is. So I, I think that's another part of the equation that really makes these conversations difficult. Not that it's in favor or against some of what we're saying here, but it's one of those fun reminders of like, we're talking about God in this way as if he is super personified and constrained to time when I'm not convinced he is. Um, yeah. Can I respond to that before you get to the yes, next stuff? Yes. <laughs> I think you're exactly right. I think we all have assumptions about God's relation to time, God's similarity or dissimilarity to us. Um, I've done a lot of the work to sort of lay out my view on those things. I do think God acts through time. I do think God is universal without a localized body and yet relational. But you're exactly right. All those kinds of issues are going to come into play. And if you're going to give a a good model that addresses all the the facets of the question, I think you have to come to some kind of conclusion on those kinds of issues. Um, and I've tried to do that in some of my writings. So <laughs> I love that answer. My whole new thing, though, because um, I, I, I think you've kind of presented your, your argument against omnipotence. I kind of want to present why I think of omnipotence and let you respond to that instead of us just responding to your beliefs. And I hope you don't feel like we're ganking up on you or anything. (laughs) (laughs) 
No, <laughs> we're so intimidating. Not. Good, good. good. <laughs> yes, yes. Christian is the most intimidating man on earth. I don't know why Tiberius <laughs> chose. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, wait. So, so for me, I, I think of, and this is going to excite some some Methodist followers and maybe uh, upset some who don't believe experience should account for anything. In my experience of salvation, it was this true, meaningful moment for me where I kind of feel like I reached some kind of enlightenment. My lifestyle changed. I felt this burden of guilt kind of drop off all of those things. That was part of my experience. So I'm starting there, and I know that's aggravating people that I'm starting there and not the Bible or somewhere, but just just hang on. Hey, you're, um, <laughs> I'm totally with you there. That's perfectly fine with me. Cool. I'm used to you. It's fine. I um, so, so for me, I, I have to believe this thing of salvation is real. It seems as though these ideas of sin and things that were burdening me, even the law, I want to point out, point out as far as my beliefs concern, salvation releases us from that as well. And guilt, all those things also have to be real for salvation to be real for me. And the way I view salvation is it is reliant on Jesus in some way. I've yet to kind of decide, you know, I, I kind of, I'm not a huge fan of penal substitution, but I'm like, ah, I don't know which one I am a fan of, but I don't think it's that quite, maybe, I don't know, asterisk mark, get to that later. But in order for salvation to make sense for me, then Jesus, who in my belief is God, he had to have the power to intervene in that way. And, and I think for me, it kind of goes into if you're not all powerful, if you're able to change your mind, which I know is a lot of your stuff is about the Bible versus say God changed his mind. If he's able to literally change his mind, I'm like, man, why, why couldn't he have just changed his mind? <laughs> you know, I could have been born with this salvation experience, all these things. Like why did salvation need to happen? Why did Jesus need to happen? If God isn't all powerful, if he's able to just not do that, which is funny because I'm basically saying because of my belief of him being all powerful, he can't not do that. <laughs> So it's kind of That's ironic big. given the, the context of the myself, argument. Yeah. You're making my <laughs> argument here. <laughs> but, yeah, but, but then I guess that begs the question of why did why couldn't he have just changed his mind then? Why did salvation need to happen? Well, because changing God's mind didn't mean that you got salvation. Because as a Methodist, assuming you kind of follow the general Wesleyan soteriology, uh, yeah, it's funny. Salvation. I'm Lutheran. I just really like the quadrilateral. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> All right, well, then this is not going to apply. But if you were Wesleyan, <laughs> you would say God doesn't save you without your cooperation. Salvation always includes some kind of creaturely response to God. In the Methodist tradition, it's all about prevenient grace, the idea mm -hmm. that God acts first and empowers a response. Mm -hmm. So salvation would not be some omnipotent move by God by which you're a passive, you know, pawn and everything is done to you, you'd have to cooperate in some way. And I tell you, I know I'm, I'm biased here, but it seems like the usual way salvation is talked about in scripture, that we have to do some believing, we have to do some repenting, we have to have some faith, we have to do, mm -hmm. there's some action on our part that's part of the salvific uh, process. Yeah. Okay, I, I think. Sorry, your answer is kind of helping me dissect my own thought process a little Good, bit better, okay. which, which is part of the point of this. This is fun. Yes. Um, I, I think part of it is, in my mind, God has the power to save me because He created all things. So I am part of this overarching creation narrative, and that gives God power over all things that are created. Um, so I, my my question is not going to be two part. Of a, do you? Well, let's just start there. Do you think God place. created all things? What did God create? I think God is the creator of all things, but never, ever, at the beginning and now, ever, single-handedly. God's creating was always in relation to what God had previously created, and that creating is everlasting. I talk about that in one part of this particular book, but I've talked about in others. So I think you're right. If you think that God once was all alone, and then created the universe out of absolutely nothing, then that God seems to have the kind of omnipotent power that God could just up and save whoever God wants to save. And if this God is loving, God to save everybody. And if the God is truly loving, God to get rid of all evil. But you and I don't live in a world with all evil, without evil, I should say. So um, maybe we should rethink this idea that God's omnipotent, including rethink that there was a time in which God existed all alone and then created the world out of nothing. 
This is the fun of debating people smarter than you. It makes so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, okay, so in your belief then, is what you're saying is there was never a time where God was all alone? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Isn't that See, a that, wild that's idea? a whole new premise then, yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So what were the first things then? <laughs> now we're getting into that weird time thing. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's like asking what was the first moment of God's life? <laughs> there was okay, no first enough. moment if you're, yeah. yeah. So if God has always been creating, now I can say there's a first moment in the life of our universe. Mm-hmm. I can believe in the Big Bang. I just think there was something prior to our universe, probably the chaos of a previous universe. But the basic notion is God is everlastingly creating moment by moment in relation to what God previously created. And that's going to be important not only for the omnipotent stuff, but working through these questions of evil that we've been working through. And and like you rightly said, Mm -hmm. helping us to think about salvation, whether or not God requires our cooperation or God could just stamp a finger and everybody goes to heaven. Mm, man. <laughs> Sorry. There's, there's just so much. It's so much fun. Yeah. I, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I am. This is just my, my free plug of the episode. I am starting another podcast myself. That's going to be dummy for theology. And I'm just going to go over different theological ideas. So the idea of time and stuff really intrigues me, especially Good. that the Bible kind of starts with in the beginning. God was in God was in the beginning as in not creating the beginning so that's right. always kind of an interesting man the bible starts really weirdly when you think about it yeah it doesn't I mean think, that he uh, didn't create the beginning but that's not what it says <laughs> i think the nrsv says in the beginning when god was creating the heavens and the earth the spirit hovered over the deep which is huh. a formless void there's something there even at the beginning of our universe that's not a god all alone creating out of nothing hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I would say personally, I don't like the idea of there being a universe before ours because that means that uh, Galactus is canon to our universe because that's his origin. <laughs> and I'd rather that be, didn't be a thing because I don't think we have the Fantastic Four around to save us. Oh, man. Well, little do you know. <laughs> no, I, uh, I love it. Love it. No, I also just watching the the people who do that kind of the science of looking into the Big Bang and how all, all those things started, assuming you believe the Big Bang, I know. Probably most of our listeners don't, but I'm a proponent of it. I, I think it's it's interesting to see how the scientists who even come up with like string theory, found the God particle, all that, try to describe that moment. And they all kind of agree that they, we have no idea what happened before. I forget what they call it, but it's like moment prime or the prime moment or whatever. And it's like, uh, man, yeah, that's yeah. um, that's still a that's big why question. It's, <laughs> it's a metaphysical question. Science as we currently know it doesn't have the tools to answer that question. It's not a question that we shouldn't ask. It's just that science doesn't give us the tools to answer it, at least now, maybe ever, but at least now. Not yet. Um, and so we can speculate. It may be the case that there was just God all alone prior to our universe and absolute nothing but God. Or maybe my theory is correct, or maybe there's been a universe that you know God didn't create, kind of hanging out. That's not my view, but that's that's. There's a lot of metaphysical options on the table. Yeah, and I'm I'm gonna. This is my last note. I'm gonna see if if Chris has anything else before we move on. But I, being someone who who's a big fan of the eminence of God and the transcendence of God, I kind of believe both sides of that coin. Sure. I really like arguments like yours. In the sense that I think it kind of refocuses people on the idea that God is in all things. So even mm-hmm. if I don't fully agree with everything, I'm like, I, I do wish there was more of a focus on how God does cooperate with creation and is in all mm-hmm. things. So that's yeah. one thing I really do appreciate about your work that I Good. think is Thank helping you. people refocus on that. Yeah. Um, so would you gentlemen say that we've answered the question, why does it matter if people believe in omnipotence or not? Or do you think there's more we need to add to that? Well, that, that would be up to the guest. <laughs> Well, I'd like to say one more thing about it, because I think the strongest uh, criticism of my view is the criticism that if you have a God like mine who's not omnipotent, who is the most powerful, always loving, always acting, but can't control others, then the critic might say to me, okay, what kind of guarantee do we have that everything's going to work out okay at the end? In other words, it's the eschatological question. Because most traditional theologies have got an omnipotent God, and God can decide to kick butt and send some people to hell and some people to heaven or everybody to hell or everybody to heaven. You know, God can just up and do whatever. 
And so we can trust that there's, well, maybe trust is not the right word, but that somehow God will single-handedly bring about some conclusion. And I don't have that in my God. Mm -hmm. However, the God I believe in is relentlessly loving. And that means that I happen to believe in an afterlife. I think God continues to invite all creation to salvation, to a life of love, whatever that looks like, depending on the complexity of the creature. And because God never, ever gives up on anybody or anything, I have the genuine hope that love will eventually win and all things will be reconciled, to use the language of the Apostle Paul. But I don't have that kind of guarantee that can only come from an omnipotent move. Yeah. I um, I will say, I, I think that most people, I was going to say most Christians, I think most people need certainty a little bit too much. You know, yeah. you know and I, I you know, that's, that's one of my things with the Bible too. I'm like, I, I, I believe the Bible is completely true and it involves stuff of how I live my life and how I interact with God. But I, I think it can be wrong about any number of other things. Yeah. And yeah. that's something that makes a lot of people really uncomfortable. Um, yeah. You know, in, in my view, having a, a God who is all powerful and loving that for some reason isn't stopping these things. Yeah. I mean, that's people need that certainty of, well, of knowing why God's doing the things he's doing. And I, I think for me, I'm like, I, I don't need that certainty. And I think, you know, on your end, there's also that, you know, people who desperately need the certainty that God's going to win in the end. I'm like, well, why, why can't you, you, you know. cause I guess to me, if you have certainty, it's not a relationship. Mm. I can't have a relationship with the Bible. If I'm certain that it's just a handbook, then it's, mm. you know, like I, like I need to have, some level of mystery of of uncertainty to have a relationship with someone. If I fully knew Christian, Christian would just be boring. I wouldn't have a relationship because I would never talk to him. I know what he's going to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. It, it, on this issue, if we're just kind of talking about psychology and the need some people have for certainty, I think there's a lot of people who have the need for the security that comes from certainty, and they link it to omnipotence. So if I come along and say God is not omnipotent, now they can't feel secure. Now they mm -hmm. can't be certain. And that pulls the rug out from underneath them. And so yeah. they'd rather have the comfort of that certainty and security. Now, usually what happens to those persons is that at some point in their life, they encounter some big question. You know, their kid dies of cancer or their spouse cheats on them or their kid comes out of the closet and they don't know what to think about things or whatever. Something comes up that makes them rethink the certainty about God that they thought they had. And when those people go through those times, they usually come my direction <laughs> in the sense of coming to the ways of thinking that I'm proposing here. Because those ways that I'm suggesting, I think, do a better job of handling those big questions. Yeah, I'd say I prefer certainty. And Josh and I have had this debate several times before because it oh, increases man. my understanding and my willingness to go along with certain things. In that I prefer, you know, I'm never going to understand every single aspect of God while I'm on this planet. I, I have to accept that fact as much as it irks me. Yeah, you have to go to Mars where he's watching with his popcorn. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're not bringing up Dr. Manhattan here. <laughs> yeah. It's, Did you say that certainty helps you learn? Is that what you said? No, it helps my understanding. Understanding. Is in like it, God is, has allowed all these things to happen. He allowed Adam and Eve to fall knowing he already had a plan in case things happen this way, knowing they would happen this way so that eventually when Jesus comes back and those who have repented of their sins and turned to him will be with him for eternity. Like that is certain to me. I know, I don't know steps one through 120, but I know there's a step one and I know there's a step 120 that helps me establish myself firmly. Like, as I said before, like there's some things I'm never going to know. Like, why did that person have to die? Why can't we just keep existing for however long? And then eventually most of us would, maybe some of us would come to faith later on. Who knows? I'm not God. And that uncertainty does hurt me. But at the end of the day, the certainty of him being who he is, is what keeps me firm where I'm at. And what's the basis for your certainty? What he says and who he is and what he's done. And how do you know that? Well, I mean, if we're using examples from our own life, uh, all the times where I have acted against who I am who I truly am without him and go, that did not come from me because there is so no your reason. Experience, your experience of something beyond yourself gives you certainty that God's exist, God exists. 
that's part of it. I mean, and you go to with, with scripture and I'm an inerrant kind of guy. Okay. And I mean, kind of obvious with me, it's like God has over time proven himself over and over to be this love, to be the one who, even despite people acting wicked, uh, being wicked, continues to love them, continues to offer a way out, even knowing they're not going to make that choice. That certainty helps establish me on that cornerstone of like, okay, this is where I am. Yeah, I think you're you're like most people who claim to be certain about these things. You have two two bases. One, a particular view of scripture that you think you could count on as being without error. And two, a particular uh, assurance of experience that you have no doubts about. And I think that's very common. Now, what usually happens for people to give up certainty is they start doubting that the Bible has, is error-free because they see errors in the Bible. Or they start realizing, you know, I've been wrong about my experience sometimes. How can I be certain about this experience? Um, and then what usually happens this I'm not saying it's going to happen to you, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what usually happens is people then deconstruct. <laughs> yes. And they go, okay, well, I have got nothing now if I can't be certain of my experience in the Bible. Um, uh. And then after a time of deconstruction, start people start saying, okay, well, then how am I going to live my life? How am I going to make any sense of things? And then the kinds of ideas that I propose start making sense to them. Because what I'm proposing isn't just like, you know, I'm just not pulling out of my butt. Like I've got some reasons. I've got some arguments. I've got some data, not the, not proofs, but I've got some uh, uh, a case to be made. And that sounds attractive to people. Well, I've gone on record several times on the show of being, and I know how contradictory this statement is, I'm a huge believer in doubt. Okay, that well, that's weird. Yeah, every every Christian should doubt, if not, I mean, should way, be way more than once. But yeah. over time, because that has always affirmed my faith. At the end of the day, no matter where I was, no matter what I was going through, I had to look in the scriptures. What does it say? I mean, thank God, I just got done with Hebrew syntax next to Jesus. I'm done for the rest <laughs> of my life. I'll never have to parse <laughs> another Hebrew verb unless I want to. But now I have a better understanding of the language. Like, what is the original intent here? I can go back. Uh, is it really translated the right way? Uh, is this word, does it actually mean what it says in the original Hebrew and English? Like, I can yeah, do but that. You, if you've looked at the scripture, you know that that's not the case, right? I mean, if you looked at the Hebrew, you know that the ver the vowels aren't the same. You know that the word can mean a variety, especially the Hebrew words, can mean such a wide variety of things. So it's it's strange to me that you would have these kind of certainty when you know that the original text have varieties, have you know different vowel systems, have a range of meanings. So, but I'm not trying to take it no, away no, no, from no. you. I'm just saying it's You're fine. It's a strange, <laughs> it's a strange thing. I mean, because at the end of the day, it affirms what I already know that God is who He says He is. And humans, I don't think uh, when I say inerrant, I don't mean we have 100 percent word to word translations of what is originally intended. What I mean is that the words that God spoke to his prophets and to his original writers, we have them today. Now, translated from Hebrew to English, Greek to English, so on and so forth, I don't think we have a one-to-one -one all the time. I mean, we've no. even talked about that with just the word almighty here today. But I do at the end of the day, it's like God protected those words for us despite human intervention. Mm. I uh, just want to throw out there, inerrancy is a, a word that I've I've come to not necessarily disagree with, but I just kind of avoid it because it's – which might be what happens with omnipotence because I'm just kind of at this point of like how hard it is for me to explain. Like if I say I believe in inerrancy, what I mean is I specifically the things that deal with this are, are without error. That's like, you know what? It's just easier to not use the word. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've but, got a question for you guys because, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm strongly against inerrancy. I think that's the wrong way to go. And I'm not certain, like Christian is, and I'm getting rid of omnipotence, like it sounds like Joshua wants to keep it. Um, <laughs> you guys are supposed to be about unity. How do the three of us find unity despite these, I think, pretty significant disagreements? Um, you know, whether or not the Bible has errors, that's split a lot of churches up. Me running around saying God is om not omnipotent, that's going to piss a bunch of people <laughs> off. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, yeah. So, I mean, what is unity? I think earlier, probably. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is not like, you know, do you like the Lakers or the, or the Warriors? <laughs> you know, these are big issues. So, 
I'm, I'm turning to you, not because I've got the answers. What does unity look like when our disagreements are so profound? I mean, did, did Jesus Christ save you from yourself? Yeah, I think you and I have a different view on that. I don't no, think God, I'm Jesus saved me for... So I'm just saying that would not be something that unifies us. We'd have different beliefs. I think I have intrinsic value. I'm not perfect, obviously. There's some things I'm trying to change. But um, I'm not a person who thinks I ought to self-deny all the time. I think there's certain things about me that are valuable. I suspect you would agree with some of that and probably disagree with others. So like, I'm kind of skeptical we could even find a fundamental belief that would unite the three of us. <laughs> Maybe that there's a God. I believe there's a God. I think you guys do. <laughs> but... <laughs> Well, okay. So this is, this is me backtracking through our conversations today. Okay. Um, I have to apologize to Christian. I'm going to kind of ignore the inerrancy thing for a bit. <laughs> That's okay. okay. But I, I really feel like a lot of what you're saying, from what I've read even, it's it's almost as though you're saying God is infinity minus one powerful. And I'm saying <laughs> he's infinity powerful. And I'm like, you know, at the end of the day, your God's still pretty similar to mine. <laughs> like, uh, it's not quite the same. I'm like, man. And I think this is a good opportunity to bring up the am, amipotence term, too, yeah. because I, I think we probably all would agree on that term in some way. Um, it also sounds like even though we might disagree on what salvation means, because you, you seemed a little affirm when I talked about my experience of salvation, that we all probably have yes. that similar experience, do value the Bible, do value God and do value Jesus. I do. So there yeah. has to be some overlap, even if it's yeah. not super significant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if we get really general, we have, we could have. Yeah, some yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, which, you know, maybe as good as we, we can hope for. Um, I'm, I'm guessing because like you just laid out some problems you have with atonement theories. And I think I have some of the same similar problems. But a lot of other Christians think one or more of those are essential to being a Christian. So they couldn't be on the same page with us on the details there. OK, I have a question for all of us now. <laughs> OK. Because okay. this this might answer the other question. We'll see. As a Christian, what is your mission? Hmm. I got. I know my answer quickly. Oh, perfect. Yeah, my it. mission in life is to live a life of love. Hmm. Yeah. Now, I think a lot of Buddhists could say the same thing. So I'm not saying only Christians have that mission, but that's my mission. Yeah. I think I I, I know I agree with that. I was going to say I think we both would agree with that. I mean, I definitely agree with that. Um. Of course, we probably would differ some on what that love means, but I think there's a lot of things when we're out doing the Christian things of showing love that we are probably doing the same things. Yeah. I'll say for me, it's uh, I'm, I'm here to love God and love my neighbor as myself and then to make disciples. Great. I got no problem with that. We'll see. Yeah. Good. Uh, unified. So maybe the unity is in the mission. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll we'll know, you know, the level. <laughs> When we start looking at the details, you know, I just co-edited this book on LGBTQ stuff. There's a whole bunch of people in my denomination who don't think I'm a Christian at all because of my views on queer issues. Um, so they would say they're loving. I think I'm loving. But what it actually looks like is pretty different when it comes to queer matters. Oh, yeah. Well, here's what I'll have to say on that is that when I go to church on Sunday morning, I – I have put my trust and faith in Jesus Christ. He has saved me from myself. And I have to put my trust and faith that Jesus Christ has done the same thing to the people around me. So I don't, I'm never going to know that. I can't see your soul. You can't see yeah. mine. All I know is that I have to trust that who Jesus is is who he said he was and that he's done the same mighty work in those who have repented of our sins. So we can get into the details, the nitty gritty of all that, but that's good enough for me. Yep. One okay, of my good. favorite lines ever said on this show... <laughs> Was it from any of us? I'm sorry, guys. But uh, the Reverend, <laughs> some of my favorite lines are from, from you guys too. But but one that I really liked, um, Reverend Justin Coleman was on the show. And he said, and it was funny because he was saying it jokingly, but it really stuck with me. This this The statement was, I'm just really glad there's not going to be a theology test when we all get to heaven. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? Oh, that's people said yeah, amen. Glad about that. I'm, I'm glad that God's not going to make me take a test at any point. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. I, I mean, I, I don't think having the right theology is the reason you go to heaven, which, you know, that's that may seem really obvious to the three of us, but there's a whole lot of Christians who think that mm -hmm. you don't have the right set of beliefs. You can't rightly be called a Christian. 
But what I'm also saying is that even if the three of us think that love is central, um, we might have some pretty interesting disagreements on what love looks like in particular situations. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that's that matters. I'm not sure exactly how that all plays out in the end, but it matters in the present. Yeah. Um, we we actually we did an episode. We do these roundtables. We have a bunch of people from different traditions come together and kind of just discuss different topics and try to find some unity there. And recently we talked about kind of the difference of unity and uniformity. Mm, And that that was one I I really liked because it's one of those – we don't all have to be on the same page to have unity, to to get along in Christ and love and all those things. We don't have to all be the same person, same robotic, you know, formulas, all that kind of stuff. And I think that's a really important part of this conversation. Um, and you know, even like the practical stuff, maybe there's times where Chris, I'm going to pick on you and Go for it. just know that this is an example. So I'm not saying that this is or is not true, but maybe there's times that, uh, Tom and I are going out and doing an outreach to those in the LGBTQ community and showing them love. And maybe you're not comfortable doing that. Maybe, and this is also not true, but just for the sake of the thing, maybe I disagree with him and he's affirming of them. And I'm just like, hey, I don't think that that's a good Christian lifestyle, but I want to help them anyway. So I'm comfortable helping in this mission. We're all disagreeing. I'm helping with this mission. And maybe next time we're all three doing the thing together. I think we're able to have unity, even not do all of the same things together without having to be uniform, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's it's tough. So I'm thinking about your example. And I'm thinking about people in my denomination who say, well, I love queer people. I love my gay neighbor. Mm -hmm. Um, And they're welcome at my church, but they can't teach our Sunday school class. And um, they need to repent of their gay lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I love them. Mm -hmm. Most gay people I know, most queer people I know, that doesn't sound like love to them. (laughs) It doesn't sound like love at all. So... The three of us saying we all love, but we do it in different ways might not be felt as love by those who we're trying to express love to. Yeah. And I think that's where that's where you get the really practical disagreements of, of, you know, um, I think we could have unity within in this example, us three still. And then maybe Bob, who is, you know, a gay pastor wouldn't be able to have unity with Christian. He's iffy on me in this example because, you know, I made myself you know, against it, but man, he loves Tom. <laughs> so there's definitely <laughs> different degrees of this unity, even in, in those examples. And man, I would love to get deeper into the LGBTQ conversation, but we're an hour in. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, maybe, we sure are. <laughs> maybe we'll put a pin in it and do uh, a, another part of this some yeah, other cool. time. Well, if, if I've really enjoyed our, back. yeah, I'd love to do that. I've enjoyed our conversation. It's been Very fun so. having you guys press me and let me press you back. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, it's always fun uh, when uh, someone smarter than you tells you that you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, well, speaking love of it. all that, like, okay, what would it take for all of us to make a complete 180 on this to change our current stances? I'll go first. On, on uh, what issue? On, uh, on uh, the issue of the definition of how omnipotence is, what it actually oh, gotcha. truly is. Yeah. I, for me, I, I know I've been silly a couple times earlier, but like, I, I'm not being when I say this. It would literally take God to come down and say you have it wrong for right. me to flip on this because when I look into scripture, when I look at everything else, I don't see the opposing view completely. Like, like we've said before, the things I agree with what you're saying, but not wholly. So that's what it would take for me. I guess for me, it would be someone would have to explain to me more about God's relation with time to make the jump more or less. And, and I think it would be the same thing if I started on your end. You know, I think it's because I already have this belief and experienced God the way I did. I, I'm just being honest. You know, I have that. This is what I've always believed bias. <laughs> sure. So yeah. I, I think that would be the one part that would be the biggest hurdle for me. And I know you mentioned you talked about time in this book. So maybe I need to read that and reexamine myself and just kind of think about it. But I think that's the big thing for me is just kind of to throw the time wrench in it all. Uh, I, I think depending on how God relates to time and stuff, there's a problem with all of these views, right? If we're saying that God could, if we're just going to put him in our time zone, before a guy rapes someone, God could have just immediately sent him to hell. Well, that kind of gets into this, well, he judged someone before they did something thing. Did he know the future? What's going on there? Why, you know, if he's able to stop it in the moment, well, then, yeah, he should absolutely stop it. If he's just afterwards sending him to hell, well, from us, why didn't you do it beforehand? And then, you, you know, there's, there's all these things that are, 
issues that to me could be resolved if I had a better understanding or grasp on time itself and how God relates to it. Okay, good. For those who are listening or watching, um, I addressed those issues in, in very plain English in a book called Open and Relational Theology. Uh, God's relation to time is a big part of that book. Um, but, so, but back to the question. You know, my answer would be similar to Christians on this. You would have to take some sort of experience of omnipotence for me to change my mind. And as soon as I say that, I realize to myself, I've never experienced an omnipotent move of God. And as far as I know, nobody in their entire universe has ever experienced that. At least by that, I mean, you know, you talk about your salvation, Joshua. That seems, I, I, I have a hard time believing that was an omnipotent move by God's part because you had some sort of, it seemed like you were alive. <laughs> you were probably responding in some way. You were saying yes in some way. <laughs> so um, the very fact that it would take an omnipotent move by God to, to make me change my mind about omnipotence and that I've never, ever <laughs> witnessed that gives actually more support to my view that God's not omnipotent. But it could happen. Who knows? Yeah. You know? I, uh, <laughs> another fun wrench in there. Uh, I, I would argue, I think logically, the only way someone could experience omnipotence is by being omnipotent. <laughs> so <laughs> Maybe so, yeah. Like, uh, I think you have to have the ability to feel all power. And I think the only way to be able to feel all power is if you have all power. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to contain that much power. <laughs> yeah. One of the arguments I look at in this book is that the notion of an isolated God who's omnipotent makes no sense because power is a relational concept. You can only think about power in relation to something else. But if God is all alone, there's nothing else to be related to. And therefore, God can't be omnipotent if omnipotent is a relational mm -hmm. word. Yeah. So anyway, getting nerdy again. Sorry. Oh, yeah. No, no, that's it's, I love it. I could do this forever. Yes. I want to throw out first, because we mentioned it a lot, the title of the book, Death of Omnipotence, The Birth of Omnipotence, Omnipotence, I don't know how to say that word clearly, <laughs> um, <laughs> but we talked a lot about differing ideas about omnipotence. There's another part of that book that I, I think, you know, mentioning unity and stuff, I think that might be the part that would get us to come together a little bit more, as I like this idea of omnipotence. Um, yeah, the power of love. Yeah, ami being love, potence being power. Um, so I coined this word omnipotence to replace omnipotence. Uh, a good number of theologians have said God is both omnipotent and loving. And in this last chapter, I argue that that's, they eventually undermine their own arguments when they try to say the two are equal. I think you have to make one have a priority. And most have ended up putting power before love. So I propose what it would look like if we put the primacy of uncontrolling love first, what would God's power look like? And I think you still have a maximally powerful God, uh, but a God who can't control others because this God is a loving God. Yeah. And I, I just watched too many Disney movies. I think love is all powerful. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's where I get my theology from. <laughs> <laughs> that being noted, that being said, uh, guys, check out the trailer for Disney's Wish. Uh, this episode was sponsored by. <laughs> no, no, I, I yeah, would you wish be in a much bigger house if this episode was sponsored by. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, are we good for our God moment? Yeah. <laughs> all right. So before we wrap up, we just want to ask everyone to share a moment that they last saw God, you know, kind of recently, whether that be kind of some kind of a blessing, a challenge or whatever just happened. So we always make Joshua go first, if I'm remembering my lore correctly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So go for it, Josh. Man, I um, there's a lot um, and I'm trying to think of a good one and I'm stalling. <laughs> I, I'm going to say, say my dog. <laughs> he. He is there, there's a lot of different ways, but recently, you know, I went away for the weekend and just it, I had a lot of fun being away from him because I was with my friends and all that. And yet, because I was at a friend's house and we were just kind of doing normal life stuff, didn't come for any cool event or anything. It did feel like something was missing. Well, it's time to go to bed. I'm like, well, where's the dog? You know, when it's time to eat, I'm like, well, where, where's, where's my buddy at? You know, then when I get home, it's like, ah, things felt right again. And just kind of remembering that difference that God makes in my life too, of like, there are these moments where I'm plugged in better and life seems to make more sense, feel more right, as opposed to 
when, you know, I haven't been interacting as much. So just kind of this reminder of some things are just that fundamentally part of my life that I'm thankful that God and my dog are that way. <laughs> I'm going to cheat twice. And then again, as I always do, because <laughs> one of these will be an event that hasn't happened yet, which wasn't an option that we uh, read, read earlier. But my first one is actually going to be more serious in that uh, two friends of ours, uh, Jenny and Dino, uh, recently had some issues with the pregnancy. And as a result mm -hmm. of that, there was a huge talk of whether or not this baby would live. Uh, very scared about that. They were uh, doctors were saying, like, there's nothing that could be done. We had a lot of people praying over that issue. And I believe that God intervened on their behalf because from what the doctors were saying, like, you should just make your peace with this. And then they're not out of the woods. I'm not going to say that, but it is far more positive now than when it was. And I'm very grateful for that, for them, for that whole family. So my God moment there is seeing his, his power manifest in that moment. And I'm not trying to like get some extra last word on that subject. <laughs> I, do, I do mean that legitimately. And my second is the future one that hasn't happened yet, of course, and that I will be getting to meet everyone in person that is going to be attending the conference. And I am really excited for it. Like I can't even put it into words, just how great that's going to be for me to meet these people uh, that I have loved from afar. And Josh, sometimes a little too close mm -hmm. for my own good, <laughs> especially with the room we're going to be having together. You know what? It's okay. I love it. I'm ready for it. That's my God moments. Mm -hmm. He might take that one back once he <laughs> realizes how, how, too, truly tragic his defeat was at well, Killer Bunnies and the Quest for the Magical Care. Well, if we'll that's see. the case, I'll, I'll list a retraction <laughs> on the Let Nothing Move You podcast. There we go. There we go. <laughs> I attend a church in which one of the former pastors would talk about God moments. And um, I didn't like the phrase initially for two reasons. One, I thought to myself, a God moment sounds like this is a moment in which God alone does something, omnipotence. And there's no other creaturely forces and factors. This is obviously God did it. And I thought, I don't think that ever happens to anybody ever. So there can't be any God moments <laughs> if it's just God all alone. And then I thought to myself, well, you know, that's not the way I see reality. Um, mm -hmm. Now, another person, another way to think of God moments is to say that all of your or most of your life is creaturely moments. And then God has to jump in every once in a while. And that's the God moment. But I don't like that view because that means that God's not always present to us, not omnipresent. Mm -hmm. So I've come to think of God moments as every moment is a potential God moment because God is always with us, always acting, always influencing. But some moments, creatures respond in unique and ways to God, in, in powerful ways to God. And in those moments, even though God's present every single moment, those moments are more dramatically reflective of God's love. Mm -hmm. So in light of that, God moment for me, spending time with my grandkids this weekend. Mm. Nice, nice. You know, ironically for those listening, this is what it's like with uh, if TJ would ever explain how he uses some of his words, <laughs> because that's basically what he believes. And it, if you listen to TJ say the God moment, he always says a moment in which you particularly saw or felt okay, God. Nice. And, and it's really funny because that's why he used to always pick really small things that people are like, well, that didn't have anything to do with God at all. And he's like, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> he did that for a long time. I love it. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, all right, man. guys. Thanks for listening for this. Uh, please, if you feel led to help us out with our Patreon for the whole church and there's some bonus content you get there, like our pet peeves segment as well. Don't know if we're yeah. doing that for this episode in particular, but there's Not been a pretty good one so far. As well, we have a ton of uh, shows on the channel for AMP. Go ahead and check them out. Yeah. On the Apple podcast, you could also, there will be a subscription channel. So all of our bonus content for Patreon will be on there as well as bonus content for some of the other shows. I know for my other show that I mentioned earlier, Dummy for Theology, I'm going to once a month just go through my little pocket dictionary of theological terms. <laughs> and just pick a term to talk about once a month. So that'll be fun. Um, and of course, if you want to see the other shows without paying for anything, just see what the shows are. There's a link down below in the show notes for the Amazon Ministries Podcast Network, uh, AMP Network, if you will. It has its own link. So you can see all the shows on the network in one spot. 
All right, guys, hope you enjoyed the show. Had a really fun time discussing this with Tom today. Like a really fun time. Yeah, Very rewarding. Yeah. Great time. So, <laughs> come back next week where I won't be here unless Josh has to pull another audible. <laughs> <laughs> and I have like two hours of preparation instead of three this time around. Who knows? That's the fun. So we will be interviewing by we, I mean them, uh, Josh Patterson about his podcast, Rethinking Faith. After that, they'll have a couple of live recordings for the upcoming convention we're going to be having. We've been jazzing up this whole time. You got to come. Don, Co- uh, excuse me, Dan Koch of the You Have Permission podcast will be joining us. And then finally, at the end of season one, Francis Chan will be joining us if he knows what's good for him. Yeah, yeah. He hasn't been made aware yet, but when he does, uh, you know, the, the fear of a potentially omnipotent and maybe not omnipotent God will be struck into him and he will show up on the show. I actually criticized Francis Chan in this new book, so perfect, perfect. <laughs> Ironically, I think we have had quite a few people who've criticized Francis Chan, okay. on. And, a, and a few people that I, I know that he has problems with, and I'm like, ah, deal with it, Francis. You're coming on anyway. <laughs> I love it. It's his turn to defend himself. Oh, yeah. Thank you for listening to this bonus episode of the Whole Church Podcast. Come back Wednesday for more of our regular episodes, this time featuring Josh Patterson as we discuss his podcast, Rethinking Faith. And be sure to go over to our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash the whole church podcast to help sponsor our efforts to educate and unite the church. Thank you for listening.